Welcome to Linda's Corner. My name is Linda Bjork, and today we're going to be talking about making space in our lives for the things that really matter. I'm delighted to welcome special guest Daniel C. Daniel is the co founder of Space Makers, a productivity consulting group for busy leaders. He is also the author of Space Maker How to Unplug, Unwind, and Think Clearly in the Digital Age. You can reach Daniel at his website, spacemakers.com.au, and I'll include a link in the description. Welcome, Daniel. I'm so glad to be visiting with you today. Yeah, thank you for having me on the show, Linda. I am looking forward to talking about making space in our lives, but first, I would love to get to know you a little bit more. I loved, as I was reading through your information, some of your comments like, yeah, I live in Tasmania with my wife and three kids and 14 chickens that eat too much and don't lay enough eggs. And I just laughed because I raise chickens too, so I totally get that. So can you tell me a little bit about what it's like where you live? Yeah, so I live in this beautiful place. Uh, I chose to live here. My wife and I used to be in South Australia uh, and yeah, we moved to Tasmania. So for those of you who don't know Tassie, it's at the very bottom of Australia. Uh, if you don't know it, you may have heard of the Tasmanian Devil if you watch too much TV. Uh, I remember when the Sydney Olympics happened in 2000, they made a human um, shape of Australia but left us off the map. So, oh, ouch. Uh, but we're okay with that because it's quiet. We have beautiful mountains, a bit like New Zealand. Uh, and, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic city to live in. And so, yes, I, I have land. I actually bought land with... Uh, some friends a number of years ago, over a decade ago, and we built two houses. Um, so we actually share land and we share chickens, as you mentioned, uh, and we kind of have raised each other's kids a bit like an extended family. So oh. I have three children. Uh, I'm married. And obviously, I run a company called Space Makers. Yeah. That's wonderful. How marvelous to have a friend that you like enough that you can be neighbors and still like each other. Yeah, it's been a great journey. I mean, it's certainly, it's, it's been a bit like a marriage. There have been, you know, we had a seven year itch and there were some hard times <laughs> uh, and we had to work through that actually. And, uh, and yet it's, it's been an amazing journey. And I, I absolutely love living life in that way. And, uh, it's been a real gift. Yeah. And I love the idea you said you had a little bit of land and some chickens and there's something about being connected to the earth that does something to us and helps us become grounded. So I don't know if that came before or after your space maker's journey, but what inspired you to help us help people kind of wake up to, you know, we have, we know the positives of being connected, but not everybody's aware of some of the, the, the drawbacks and why we might want to, to step back a little bit. Can you help us understand what, what are the benefits of unplugging? Yeah. So, I mean, I think when I started to write and speak on this topic, it was about seven years ago. So well before COVID and before we all went into remote working conditions and got Zoom fatigue. And I just started to have a sense that uh, my lifestyle had become really digitally saturated. And some of that was wonderful. You know, I, I've been coaching and training people around the world for a long time and on, and that requires technology. And uh, I love that my kids can connect with people around the world. My my dad's in China, so they can have a conversation with him there. And uh, so technology is amazing. And yet I found that I was feeling a bit wired. I was habitually swiping my screen and, and kind of doing habits, which I thought, actually, I'm not sure these are really healthy for me if I consider what they, uh, the trajectory of them over a, over a time. But, but look, since then, everyone has become digitally overloaded. And I think uh, culture as a whole, we're, we're starting to recognize and, and discover this sense that we are just online too much. Uh, we are feeling wired and we're feeling tired. We are, you know, running to stand still. There's a sense where, uh, some of our habits are, are not well designed. You know, we might reach for our phone first thing in the morning or last thing at night and, and maybe instead of talking to the partner in bed next to us, we're scrolling Instagram or, or <laughs> maybe finishing a few emails uh, or playing games on our devices. And, and it's almost like, uh, well, in the words of Elon Musk, it's almost like we're becoming cyborgs. We're, mm. we're becoming mediated by technology in every area of life. And we're actually losing some of our humanity as a result. So I, I don't have an anti-technology message, but I do believe that we're overloaded and we need to deliberately 
and intentionally unplug and unwind in order to think clearly and rest fully and relate to ones that we love away from a screen. I am grateful that it is not an anti-technology message because without that wonderful advantage, you and I would not be able to have this conversation on opposite sides of the planet and to be able to come together to create a message. So I love that let's enjoy the good things, but maybe be aware of how we're using things. Now you have talked a little bit about how it affects our productivity and also the neuroplasticity of the brain. Would you mind explaining those? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the, the two questions. Why don't I start with a productivity question? Yes, please. Uh, so well, I began the book because I, I am an executive coach and I, I train and equip leaders in actually how to use technology, you know, how to get their inbox to zero and how to run to-do lists and all that kind of stuff online. Uh, but what I discovered is that there, there comes a point where more and more technology doesn't seem to be working for people. In fact, I was working with global leaders and they were online so much they had all the tech skills and they were using all the new apps, but it, they just seemed to be really distracted and unfocused and would actually be busy in the wrong direction. So I started to ask the question, look at the research, what's the connection between productivity and using technology? Uh, because culture says more technology means more productivity. And that's kind of the narrative we get from you know, media. But um, imagine a line, a graph of, of um, let's say, technology and productivity and uh, obviously, you need tech to be productive. That's just clearly true. But there comes a point where if you keep using it, keep using more apps, you're spending 9, 10, 12 hours online, uh, and you never off it, you kind of reach this productive middle where the graph plateaus and uh, more technology isn't making you more productive. But then you reach this uh, what I call digital overuse stage where the graph flips upside down like an upside down U, and the more technology you use, the less productive you become, the less happy, the less whole from the research. Uh, and so we need two sets of habits. We need the habits of what I call making pace, which are the habits of using tech and having tech skills to be productive, which is the left side of the curve. But on the other side of the curve, we need habits of space making or habits of space, which are actually about unplugging from technology in a very deliberate way in order to rest deeply and practice deep rest in order to, to reconnect with people in person, in order to practice skills and things in life that are deeply meaningful, that are disconnected. And that's actually to return to that healthy middle where you're productive and you're happy and you're whole. But not many people realize that we need to learn the skills of unplugging and of being offline. And, uh, and, and that is a new set of habits, but I, we feel it, we know we need it. Uh, and my passion is to teach us how and why to do that. I love that. So I'm imagining kind of a bell curve. Mm. And then there's a sweet spot where this is helpful. This is benefiting me, making things just wonderful. And then stopping at that point rather than just more is more is more. Yes. And it's not linear. It's not like uh, there's this sweet spot and you hit it and then you fall one way or fall the other. What I find is most of us actually need to improve our tech skills uh, because we, we don't necessarily use technology that well. And yet at the same time, we're also addicted to Candy Crush. Do you know what I mean? So <laughs> we need to be, uh, it, it's this, it's this kind of, um, relationship. Well, I mean, I suppose my message is we have a relationship with the online world. And like any relationship, you don't just, you know, you don't, you don't get married and say, yep, now I've nailed it. You know, it, it, it's a relationship. And there are times when, uh, it's good. There's times when it's bad. And I think we need to examine our relationship with our digital world and and start to examine what the quality of that relationship is like and where we need to invest more and where we need to invest less. And some of it seems like it should be intuitive. If I'm spending hours on Candy Crush, I, I know I'm not being productive. I mean, you know, some of the things seems like it should be fairly obvious. Definitely. And look, uh, in my book, I, I frame this in three sections. I talk about the paradigm of technology uh, and then the principles and then the practices. And the reason I did it that way is I originally wrote a 20 page ebook and I thought, look, how hard is it? I mean, to, I thought I'd give people practical tips. So, you know, charge your phone outside your bedroom, uh, have a digital free meal. You know, if you can have a digital day off once a week, a Sabbath. Uh, but in reality, 
like it's pretty simple to realize yeah let's just not do hours of candy crush right I mean, <laughs> an adult shouldn't need an adult to tell them that but there is something about our relationship with the online world our, our beliefs and our habits uh, even on top of the addictive design of the tools themselves that draw us into constant overuse and so unless we re-examine our loves and our longings our our heart and also like you mentioned neuroplasticity what it does to our brain then it's going to be very hard to do the simple habits of turning off your phone when it's good for you and so we need to go on that journey of examining the inner life and our inner beliefs in order to determine what really matters what are our values that we want to invest in outside of the screen and then it comes to the practices you know what do i do each day each week and each year And you brought up so many points and wonderful things that I would love to just kind of touch on. I love that you mentioned the digital Sabbath, and I was going to ask about that. Now, is your recommendation, so that would be like one day a week where you just say, hey, let's let's give it a rest one day a week. Is that kind of one of the practices that you suggest? Yeah. I mean, so I have a faith background myself, um, uh, but I looked at across like all the productivity research and all the stuff that's out there that I could find on the idea of deep rest, the idea that we actually need to practice rest rather than practice work. And we assume that, you know, rest will just happen if we're not at work. But I don't think that's a true assumption in the digital age with work-life blend and with technology intersecting with work and life. Uh, And really what I found is that the most beautiful, amazing set of practices actually come from the Judaic Christian tradition, which is Sabbath, the idea that you would dedicate a full day off uh, in order to rest individually and collectively and orientate a day around that rest uh, and, and in order to worship. So, But I use the language of in order to reflect or uh, remember who you are. And uh, and that's quite an, a fascinating concept, and I think it relates very uh, it, it, it translates really well in the digital age. And it's not about a guy, a rabbi, a guy called Abraham Heschel in the 1950s was talking about technology and disconnecting from the black and white TV because of, you know, the insidious effects of television on our lives. And he said that it's not about renouncing, tech, he said, technological civilization. Uh, it's about gaining some sense of independence from it. Uh, another guy, Walter Brueggemann, says that those who have a Sabbath live all seven days differently. So that has been my experience, that if you can have one day off a week where you're dedicating it and structuring it around true rest for yourself and others and remembering, so investing in your spiritual life, your inner life, as well as the outer life, and if you can uh, examine your tech habits within that space, and for me it involves turning off my tech for a whole day every week, uh, because for me, tech is work. And therefore, if I'm going to not work for one day a week, I need to do the opposite patterns. I often say that my uh, our brain can't tell the difference between Outlook and Instagram. So if I'm swiping and typing and communicating with you and others online using a screen and uh, using the internet as what I do in my day job, well, then if I'm on the weekend doing exactly the same habits, just using different apps and platforms, how is that rest from a neurological perspective? And so what I've discovered is actually chainsawing wood uh, in my block and you know cleaning out the chook house or going for a bike ride or playing board games with my kids or eating bacon and eggs without a screen around us, that's rest because it's not what I do for work. Whereas us just sitting there, you know, scrolling social media or watching Netflix or playing games, it's so similar to my work that I never give my brain a day off. And so it's important to define what work is for us, what rest is for us, and how might we have a beautiful, amazing pause every week, which I call the digital Sabbath. I think that is absolutely brilliant. And it brings up some of the challenges that we have in the digital age in that we are accessible 24-7. Because someone can send us an email or, or can give us a phone call or, you know, send us that, that text or, or whatever that thing is. And it does make it so that we actually have to consciously make a decision and create those boundaries. So how marvelous that you have created or chosen to follow that pattern of a, of a digital Sabbath of once a week, let me separate myself from this. And I believe once those boundaries are in place, 
then it will become easier to follow it. It might be hard the first couple times when you hear that notification to just know I can answer that tomorrow and it's going to be okay. So mm, thank absolutely. you for bringing that and you're, up. You're spot on. I mean, the whole book is about setting what I call life-giving limits or boundaries. This is the paradigm that we walk with is that more choice equals more freedom. And that freedom is defined as reducing our boundaries and having no limits. That is kind of the the narrative that we have that we soak in in American and Australian culture, uh, and yet it doesn't work for life and it doesn't work for technology. So clearly, you know, no boundaries and unlimited choice isn't great when it comes to food and diets or for physical activity and sedentariness or even relationships. You need life-giving boundaries if you're going to have a stable, healthy, monogamous relationship. Uh, but when it comes to technology, we haven't made that translation. We haven't realized actually less is more and there are times when I need to use it, but I need really well-designed boundaries and limits so that I can experience the fullness of humanity. And that actually is what makes me truly free. You know, no limits doesn't make me free. Life-giving limits actually increases my personal freedom. But I need to put that into place because the assumption in my life and in the life of those I work with is that if you don't intentionally put boundaries on your time digitally, you'll always be connected. You'll always be online. Uh, so we are now in a, oh, this strange new world where to be human, we need to actually practice making space and invest in it because we won't have it if we don't. I love that. And I love the idea that this is a conscious decision. This is not that somebody is forcing me to do it, something that I have to do. This is something that I choose to do because I want to. And it makes a difference. I was uh, reading a study about it, it, weight loss, but there's going to be a connection here, where the words that they use to define something. So they, they took a group of people and said, okay, we want you to follow this diet thing. And they divide it into three groups. One, they said, if somebody asks you about it, just don't worry about what you say. Another group, they said, say, I, I can't eat that. I'm on a diet. And the third group, it was, I say, I don't eat that. And the crazy thing is, is after their two weeks or however long the study went, they, they checked to see what the words that they used about the experiment, how that affected their success. And the people who didn't really say anything, it was about 50-50. Some, some stayed on it and some didn't. The ones who said, I can't do that, had a horrible success rate. It was like 80% failure. And the ones who said, oh, I don't do that. I, I don't eat that. They had an 80% success and so it was a little mental, a, a mental exercise where the words that they used about what they were doing affected how they felt about it. One of them was deprivation. What I'm doing is depriving me. It's, you know, somebody's putting limits on me. And the other is, I made this choice and I'm going to follow through. So that's fascinating. Thank you. What a beautiful thing. So you're helping people to be able to recognize that we need to make a choice and showing the benefits of why I would want to do this. This makes me more free. This makes me more happy. This makes me more connected to the people that I care about. So that is absolutely beautiful. Now, I apologize because I threw too many things at you, but I would love to cover the neuroplasticity because I think that studies like that are fascinating. Yeah, so look, as I mentioned, I used to be a physiotherapist, uh, so physical therapist, I think they're called in the States. And uh, I remember a patient came into my outpatient clinic one day and she was walking kind of sideways, a bit like a crab, with her head turned to the right about 30 degrees. And I thought, this is interesting. It was a very unusual way of walking in. And she stayed like that the whole time when I talked to her. And uh, she had neck pain and was, had neck stiffness after a, a significant car accident and a whiplash injury many years mm -hmm. before. And her neck had just become uh, stuck. And so what was really interesting is when I actually examined her, I, I could actually rotate her neck either side, left and right. So she wasn't actually stuck and she didn't have that much pain. And so I got her to close her eyes and look in the mirror and I got her to turn her head left and right with her eyes closed. And then I said, just open your eyes when your head is neutral, like looking forward. And she opened her eyes and her head was 30 degrees to the right, exactly where she stood every day. And so for her, what had happened is because her neck had been injured and she'd habitually had her head to one side, uh, her brain had changed her map, her map of what straight was. And what she thought was straight and normal was actually 
turn to the right. Does, does that make sense? Wow. And so that's called neuroplasticity. And, and so our brain changes based on our habitual beliefs and behaviors. And so, um, and, and it can change again. So, I mean, for her, I got her to practice literally looking in a mirror, closing her eyes and opening it when her neck was straight until uh, the joints in, in her neck and her brain started to recognize what straight was. And that's actually all we needed to recover this lady into like a healthy way of living and moving. When it comes to the online world, I feel like it's not a bad analogy because I think, you know, we've talked about digital overload. I think all of us have shifted to this point, this new existence where we are actually overloaded and we're using the, the digital world way too much. And yet our brain has changed to the point where we can't even see or recognize how it's impacting us. We feel it. We know that we're busier than ever before. We're polarized. We're disconnected. Uh, we're struggling to have meaningful relationships. We're running to stand still. You know, we feel, we feel the effects of walking like a crab, but, but we can't quite place our kind of finger on what's wrong. And, and I think part of the problem is, uh, technology is not additive like a hammer where you pick up the hammer and you use it and you put it down. Uh, it's actually organic, which means that the more you practice the internet, the more it changes your brain from the inside out based on those practices. Uh, you know, for example, because the internet requires very fast swiping and moving between things, chopping and changing, well, we have less attention because our brain has learned to require very small snippets of information, not examining things in a very deep, long-term way. You know, it's harder to read a book nowadays without getting distracted because our brain has changed. So, so the point is that... Um, the brain has changed with our internet practice and uh, there's benefits in disconnecting in order to, to allow our brain to, to rewire itself and enjoy the slower and, and silent and, and more still pursuits that we used to enjoy. That is really amazing. Now, what do you think about kids and cell phones? Like, you know, what age? Because you've got kids, right? Mm, yeah, yeah, I've got a 15 year old, oh, nearly 15 year old girl and uh, a 10 year old boy, a 12 year old boy. So, yeah, the beautiful kids. And yes, lots of tech uh, conversations. So, do you have like a certain, you know, thoughts like, well, at this age or when they get their first cell phone or, mm -hmm. or, or do you have any limits or suggestions on that? Yeah, absolutely. And again, I think it's about the conversations. You know, it's about connection before correction. Uh, and, and it's about a relationship with your kids and discussing the relationship with the online world. Uh, so, uh, yes, I have a limit for my children. And if I say this, people are like, whoa, that is crazy. But um, <laughs> our kids don't get mobile phones until they're 15 years old. So my daughter is almost there. Uh, there's been a grading and a moving up to that. Uh, but they won't have social media until they're adults. And this isn't just me being kind of really strict, nasty dad. I actually see in the research the effects of these devices. Uh, and I'm actually following what the, the leaders of Silicon Valley are doing with their children. So if you look at Steve Jobs, he didn't let his children have an iPad because he said it's better for their mental health if they sat around a table and read books and talked about history. Uh, Evan Spiegel, the CEO of Snapchat, limits his, like, I think his stepson screen time to 45 minutes a week. Uh, you see the same patterns in all the Silicon Valley leaders that they're really strict on screen time for their kids because they realize how damaging their own apps are for mental health and they're, they're seeing their own research. Um, and so for young people, all I would say is, um, I'm not saying there's right and wrong, but for when I, I do speak to um, parents of tweens, uh, so primary school aged children, uh, do you call it primary school in the States? It's like before high school. Anyway, the younger age uh -huh. school. Uh, and, uh, and so when I speak to parents in that age group, I say, look, firstly, go slow, go slower than culture tells you, go slower than popular media, uh, because the research is becoming increasingly clear that the more time young people spend on screens, the less happy they are, the more anxious and depressed they become because they're trading time for activities that give them life, like kicking a soccer ball getting out and exercising, you know, reading books, eating dinners unplugged, and they're trading it for just lots and lots of time on screens. And so get them into that pattern as late as you can uh, and, and at the same time really invest in helping them love the real world 
so that they can have something to refer back to when they become addicted later on in life. I love these ideas that it is based on the research and on what this does to our brains and our bodies. It brings to mind, I've also read a lot of research on depression and teens, and there is a very strong correlation between social media and their depression. And so I, if we want our kids to be healthy and happy, even if they're saying, no, in order to be happy, I have to have a phone like my friends, that the research says that's not the case. It doesn't bring happiness. And it also, when you talked about Silicon Valley and how they recognize what their apps do, it brings up the idea or the point that they are designed to be addictive. They are designed to keep you on the screen. So when you, you pull up your phone and, and you thought you were just looking for 15 minutes and it turns out to have been an hour and 15 minutes, that was purposefully done. Someone trying to keep you on there. And as we are aware that this is the intent, then it can hopefully help us to wake up a little bit and say, oh, that means I need to choose to turn it off. I, I am in charge of setting my limits. I am in charge. And perhaps you've seen there, there's a, a documentary called uh, The Social Dilemma, where they, they explain some of the research behind some of the things that we're talking about today, how, um, how it can affect us in negative ways if we don't choose to create our own limits. Um, it can do really bad things for us, unfortunately. Yeah, look, you're absolutely right. And Really, it is hard. It's hard as a parent, though, because you're surrounded in a culture where you want to love your kids, you want to do the best for them. You know that they're going to need to use technology to thrive in this world, and the pressure really is incredibly strong to be on Snapchat and TikTok at a very young age. Uh, and so, it's it's really tough as parents to keep saying no, um, because it's not like smoking in the sense that there's really no positive benefits of smoking except for the social benefits and things like that but but you, there's benefits to technology but it, it is like you mentioned particularly in teen girls uh, and guys but particularly girls the research on mental health and social media overuse is is pretty scary for guys it's online online pornography again as a, a very general you know uh, look at the research um, and and if we can if we can teach our kids different habits at an earlier age and help them have life-giving limits that's really useful. Uh, I could give you one practical tip we, we use, which is oh, might yes, be useful. Oh, yes, please. Uh, basically, we have tokens, which I think has been useful. There's downsides to it, but but our kids get uh, they get 12 tokens a week. Each token is half an hour because we wanted to give them control over their screen time. I didn't want to say you can only do this on Monday or this on Tuesday. So they they have a limit to how much screen time they get each week, and they can – you know, they're not allowed to do more than three hours of like on one day because the research says that if you do more than two to three hours, um, it, it definitely changes your mental health and, and it's bad for you. And you can see the outcomes when the kids have done three hours of screens in a day. But, um, yeah, so, you know, they can, they can boom, they can bust, they can spread it throughout the week. But we're saying this is your limit. And if you want to uh, experience the best of life generally, well, then, you know, use your limits here and use your limits there. We, we give them more for screen time academics. So when they're doing maths homework, they get another extra amount of tokens. But it's basically saying, look, it's a really important part of your life, but it shouldn't be your entire life. And I'll teach you the ability to, to um, use your tokens and determine when throughout the week you spend your time on a screen. Uh, and we model the same behavior ourselves. That's my other message mm. for parents. Before you can shift the patterns and behaviors of your children, you must look at your own digital habits and behaviors, which is partly why I wrote the book, because kids will look at you and what you do, and they'll immediately make connections between what you're saying to them versus what you actually do when they're watching your behaviors. That is brilliant. And I love your token plan, how it allows freedom within limits, and also it helps them to practice creating those boundaries. You're giving them the opportunity to say, oh, okay, that means I can use this much right now, or I can save it and do a, a bigger chunk here. But they're practicing those skills of, of using limits and of having some conscious behavior with this screen time, which I think is very important. We did something 
sim I used tickets where it was, okay, if you can earn this much for doing XYZ chores or your school or whatever, and then it's worth this much of your, your screen time. Yeah. So anyway, do you have anything else you want to make sure you cover before we close? Not really. I, I just, I value technology and I love the life it's given me, but I, I also really value life disconnected. And we just forget how beautiful life is and how wonderful it is. Just look at a tree and just enjoy noticing it or laughing at a table with kids or playing a board game and, and actually having your attention on the moment, you know, or even pushing a child on a swing and not scanning, you know, how many hearts you have on Instagram. Like the, the world is so rich and wide and beautiful and it's just not worth reducing our life to what we see online. And so a little bit of space makes a lot of difference. And I just encourage people to rethink that and to develop healthy habits. I love it. I love that you pulled it all together with just that quick reminder that this is a tool and we can use it as a tool and it can benefit us rather than enslave us. And that the point is joy, a joyful life. So Daniel, thank you for your wisdom and thank you for visiting with me today. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I appreciate that. It's been a pleasure. In closing, I'd like to share a quote by Anne Lamont. She said, almost everything will work again if you unplug it for a few minutes, including you. Today, I invite you to do some unplugging and to make some space in your life for the things that really matter. See you next time on Linda's Corner. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of Linda's Corner, please share and subscribe to help us reach new listeners. I also invite you to check out my nonprofit, Hope for Healing, at the website hopeforhealingfoundation.org for free ebooks, free audiobooks, and other free resources to help increase happiness, build confidence and self esteem, strengthen relationships, manage stress, and calm feelings of depression and anxiety. I also invite you to grab a copy of one of my books, like Crushed A Journey Through Depression, or Amazon bestseller You Got This an action plan to calm fear, anxiety, worry, and stress. See you next time on Linda's Corner.